what an amazing start to the event. Thank you so much, Shelby, for your great contribution. Next, I'm pleased to welcome Christiana Clark, Managing Supervisor and Lean Machine Learning Data Engineer at Methods and Mastery. She has a passion for systems design, data architectures, optimizing full cycle machine learning workflows, and developing pipelines to integrate seamless communication across a variety of services. Christiana will present her talk, Writing Upon the Shoulders of the Imperfect, where she will implore us to stop thinking like data engineers and start thinking like agile software developers through the defiance of perfection and embrace the imperfect. Over to you, Christiana. Hi, guys. I'm here today to present to you my talk, Writing Upon the Shoulders of the Imperfect, a lesson in embracing risk. So a couple of things that I'm gonna go over today, just section one, a brief introductory into who I am, section two, the three qualities the best engineers have in tech, and section three, what embracing risks looks like for a data reliability engineer. So we'll start with section one, who am I? So my name is Christiana Clark and I'm the managing supervisor for ML and data engineering at Methods and Mastery, an agency within the Fleishman Hiller Global Network. So what I do on a day-to-day -day basis consists of a lot of ML ops and data ops. So that looks like building out ML and data pipelines and architectures at scale to help both our clients and analysts better understand conversations happening around brands. Some of our clients include Google, Android, YouTube, IBM, etc. So a bit of my background, I didn't start out as an ML or data engineer, but instead as a software developer. And while I eventually found my passion in ML and data engineering, I consider my time working as a software developer a blessing because I was given the opportunity to work with some of the most amazingly imperfect engineers. And it was during this time working with these agile development teams that has helped shape my overall approach as it pertains to ML and data engineering, especially with monitoring, automation, CI, CD, and quite frankly, life in general. So why am I here today? Well, in 2020, the DICE's tech job report listed data engineering as the fastest growing job in 2019, growing 50% year over year. But it's estimated that data engineers still spend 56% of their time just getting their systems to work and only 22% on the innovation that's bringing real value. And so this made me wonder, with all the new tooling out there centered around CI, CD and automation, why were data engineers just spending so much of their time getting their systems to work? And why was the data just not working? Well, to answer this question, I need to let you in on some hard truths that I learned as a software developer. In order to start building out reliable, scalable and efficient data systems, we have to accept the following. No data system is 100% reliable. No data is perfect. Engineers are especially not perfect. And users are really not perfect. And so we might as well stop aiming for perfection, embrace the imperfect, and start planning for the inevitable. That is to say, it's time to stop thinking like data engineers and start thinking like software developers. I'm here to tell you how. So section two, the three qualities the best engineers have in tech. So back in the day when I started out my career, I was terrified of failure. I wanted every single line of code I wrote to be perfect. And to make matters worse, there were a lot of contradictory things coming out of the Silicon Valley, especially as it related to success and failure, to name a few. Fail fast, succeed faster. Do or do not, there is no try. Failure is not an option. Failure is an option. Move fast and break things. You see my dilemma. Because the thing is, I had no idea which one of these quotes I was really supposed to buy into. For example, should I move fast and break things or move as slow as possible until everything was just right? And it wasn't until later on in my career working with these agile development teams that I learned something that if you would have told me at the beginning of my career, I would have thought you were crazy. And yet it ended up being one of the most valuable lessons I have learned throughout my career. And it's this. 
it's impossible to build something perfect. And as a matter of fact, you shouldn't. So the three qualities I saw in the best engineers in tech. One, they realized everything was error prone. Error is everywhere. And so they were ready to mitigate that error and that risk. And they did so by implementing monitoring, automation, and CICD to get ahead of those errors and iterate faster as a team. Two, they didn't sugarcoat the error. They vocalized the error to clients and the reliability of their systems, as well as set metrics in place to improve as a team. And then finally, three, they favored the simple over the complex. Their code was written thoughtfully, taking into consideration things like readability, reproducibility, and the simplification of the code base as a whole. And I think this is for good reason, because the effort to build reliable systems is not built off the shoulder of one, but upon the shoulders of the many imperfect. And what do these three qualities all have in common? They all embrace risk. It was never the quality I saw in the best software engineers, this quality of perfection, but their willingness to embrace risk, both in themselves, the user, et cetera. And it was this embracement of risk that helped guide the creation of the reliable systems they built. And so I think that we don't just have to be software developers to implement these qualities into our daily lives as data engineers and ML engineers and embrace risk. And so that leads me to section three, what embracing risks looks like for a data reliability engineer. So I believe embracing risk is the catalyst to the rest of the seven principles of DRE because they all stem from this acknowledgement that risk is here to stay and the only way to work with it is to mitigate it. But the thing is, mitigation looks a little bit different for ML and data engineers as it does to a software developer. And so that's why I'm gonna break down each of these principles and how they relate to risk and how we can instill the qualities and these principles into our daily lives and work. And we'll start with embracing risk itself, the risk versus cost trade-off. So I'm sure we've all learned from statistics or the rise of meme stocks, the concept of risk versus cost trade-off. A low level of risk can lead to low returns. A high level of risk can lead to high returns. Mark Alvarez excellently articulates this concept in the book, Site Reliability Engineering, How Google Runs Production Systems. And I'm not gonna read out the full quote, but I am gonna read out a line that has really rung true to me throughout my entire career. And it's this, we strive to make a service reliable enough, but no more reliable than it needs to be. So as ML and data engineers, we need to ask our own version of what this question looks like as it pertains to reliability and success. For example, are we okay with our data pipelines missing out 95% of the data, or I'm sorry, pulling in 95% of the data and missing out the 5%? What are our data limitations? Are the analysts aware of these limitations? Are our clients? From my experience in ML and data engineering, they're typically not. But luckily, once we realize that risk exists in the data and systems we build, we can set standards for improvement and level those expectations amongst internal teams and clients. So what does measuring availability and reliability look like for a data engineer? Well, to start, it's not a one size fits all problem. We have to keep some things in mind when we're measuring our availability for our systems. One, what data system are we building? What are the third party services it's going to rely on? What are the limitations within our data? And so in the book that I previously mentioned on the slide before this one, there is an excellent metric to use called the aggregate availability. And this is a great metric to use for any of your data pipelines. And in this case, um, they use the data ETL pipeline. It's defined as follows. The aggregate availability is equal to the successfully processed observations per day divided by the total observations per day. And so let's say we aim for a 95% availability target with a total observation amount of 250,000 observations. We could still be operating at 95% availability target even if we process 237,000 of those observations. 
But like I mentioned earlier, it's not a one size fits all problem. Because one thing the calculation fails to consider is what the rest of that data looked like that we missed. And I realize this definitely doesn't matter for all of the systems we build, but it could for some. An example would be for machine learning. So say we plan on retraining a classification model. We don't want to over or under sample on the data. And while unlikely, it could be possible that the 12,500 data points we missed were fully representative of a highly unsampled data class. Another example of why it's important to have a strict measurement of what successfully pre-processed data looks like is suppose we have 100,000 observations that were successfully pre-processed, but they were all null values. Well, ultimately, we're not gonna ingest that into the database because we don't care about them. And so that means that we really only successfully processed 150,000 observations, leading to an aggregate availability of 60%. On top of measuring availability, it's also important to measure our overall success. So Lior Gabish, CTO of Monte Carlo, has an excellent Medium article outlining some useful KPIs to use as data reliability engineers. I'm just gonna list a few of them here that I use personally at Methods of Mastery. So we'll start with data platform adoption and trust. How can we ensure ease of use and trust? Seeing an increase in use of the systems and data we provide is a key indicator that we're doing something right. They trust the quality of our work. Next is time to detection. How fast can we detect errors? Errors are inevitable, and it is important to get ahead of them as soon as they hit. And so that's why we wanna keep our time to detection as low as possible. The second something fails, we wanna know about it. And then time to resolution. How fast can we resolve those errors? So when a pipeline fails, API is changing underneath us, we want to be able to fix those errors or add in those changes as quick as possible. So just like time to detection, we want to keep our time to resolution as low as possible. And just as it's important to measure our overall availability and success, it is equally important to vocalize those measurements. And so at Methods and Mastery, what that looks like for us is something like this. We would start out with a service level objective. And so that's documentation centered around our goals for the system we're building. It might be something like, okay, we plan to retrain these models every so often or when drift is detected or refreshing our API tokens. And then there's a service level indicator. That's how we're gonna measure those goals. So say, for example, when an X amount of drift is detected for this model, then we're going to retrain, or this many months, we'll retrain the model. And then finally, there's a service level agreement, and that's between us and the client. That's to level out our expectations and goals with the client so they're aware of any possible limitations down the line, as well as tell them what we plan to do if we don't meet those goals. And so finally, three, reduce toil, mitigate risk. So I think reducing toil is a step in a data engineer's life where they're faced with the radical acceptance of human error. And so by reducing toil, not only does that reduce some of the error that's introduced by manual processes, but it can also make our systems more approachable to the user and the lives of engineers easier. And so at m, &M reducing toil is at the heart and center of everything I do. And what I have here is actually something called a Rube Goldberg machine. And yet, it's a pretty good articulation of some pipelines I've seen in the past, whether it be at a company that's just starting out their analytics team or an established startup that's introducing ML to their workflow. And so I'm going to show you guys what reducing toil looks like to me. So this pipeline has two objectives. It wants to pre-process data, and then it wants to send it out into a machine learning algorithm. Well, as you can see here, it's incredibly fragmented. So my first step would be is to defragment these components, to consolidate them into one single pipeline. And so A, manually rerun pipeline every week. No, 
What I would do is I would automate this task. And that looks like setting up something like a cron job with Google Cloud Platform's Cloud Scheduler, and then using PubSub and Cloud Functions to kick off that pipeline. B, grab data from GCS Bucket and import into Jupyter Notebook with GSUtil for pre-processing. No, A does this. C, pray my team member will know exactly what I did on my local notebook. This is the importance of CI/CD. So all of the work I do for my pipeline is either going to be my dev work, which is most likely undergoing a PR on GitHub, or the final work in production. Either way, all of the code is documented and readily available for all of my team members. D, run process from shell script to send out data. No, A does this. E, put preprocessed data into bucket. Again, A does this. F, don't add any wildcard or indicators to relate the data to the pipeline or time preprocess. A doesn't do this, but it does something better. We already have wildcard naming conventions in place to be able to relate the artifact that was generated to that pipeline, either via the day or the pipeline that created it. Therefore, no artifacts are being lost. And then G, now that the data is processed, write another script that will send out the pre-processed data to another bucket that will reference in an AI platform prediction job. Again, A does this. H, kick off the pipeline job manually using in-house containers that don't have logging specific to our needs. So A doesn't do this, but it does something better. As I mentioned earlier, I don't want anybody pressing a button to kick off this pipeline. If it's on a schedule, let's automate it. And so another thing that this piece does is I use Docker. And so by using Docker for each pipeline component in the code, I have the proper logging relevant to that piece. And that helps me demystify the cloud logs. And finally, I, debug failure for hours because you sent out the wrong data due to a dash instead of an underscore in the folder name. Again, A doesn't do this, but it does something better. So from my software development background, I know I'm an engineer and I'm going to make mistakes. And so already in the code, we ensure that because of our naming conventions, if somebody does accidentally put in a dash, we'll replace it to an underscore. The next principle I want to talk about is monitor everything, get ahead of risk. So if reducing toil is a way of mitigating potential, hu potential human error, monitoring is a way of mitigating the whole gamut of the inevitable, and that's user, programmer, and third-party service error. So at Methods and Mastery, we need to monitor this shit out of everything, and that's because we're a MarTech agency. So take, for example, say we have 20 clients, and each of them have 40 campaigns happening at once. This means I could potentially have to keep track of 800 different data pipeline jobs. And the reality is I would absolutely lose my mind if I had to go through the cloud logs to figure out the failures, et cetera. So instead, we imp implement the proper logging and monitoring needed for each pipeline so that we can stay ahead of those errors. And at Methods and Mastery, we do this with Google Cloud Platform's error reporting in the form of push notifications and email alerts when things go awry. In turn, this makes everyone's lives easier. There are no surprises that, hey, the pipeline stopped working two weeks ago, and we can spend less time debugging and more time on doing cool things. And so five, use automation, limit risk. So just like with reducing toil, it's so important to try to prevent as many manual tasks as possible because they introduce error. But another thing people, I think, don't take into consideration that automate, automation benefits is it can help you be able to find errors faster. And here's why. I have an example. So. Say an ML engineer or data scientist is about to retrain one of their models in prod. And they retrain the model in, oh crap, it's not working as expected. Well, before automation, this used to be a question of, OK, what errors did they make during the retraining, which could be plenty or more. But once you introduce automation, it no longer becomes a question of what was the error in some of the 10 notebooks that we used to create this model, but what was a mistake we made defining the automation task itself. Another important thing to keep in mind is that automation only limits risk. It doesn't completely eradicate it. 
And so in other words, models could still potentially make predictions on crummy data. Users could still input bucket names or projects that don't exist in GCP. And above all else, it doesn't matter how streamlined your automation is, if no one can iterate upon it efficiently or replicate it in their own environment. And that brings me to principle number six, control releases, manage risk. So being able to fail fast and break things and have the processes in place to fix the things we broke is at the heart of CI CD. And yet surprisingly, I've seen a lot of data engineers and analytics teams not place that same rigor on CI CD as I have seen with software developers. And some of these reasons I think include one, it can be kind of difficult to create staging environments for third party data sources and we have to respect API limits. So a lot of times in a data pipeline, things don't fail into the millionth and one observation, but it would be incredibly unrealistic to run every single test of every possible argument to ensure that it runs properly. But despite these difficulties, we can still try to think like software developers and introduce the ICD practices into our workflows. And it looks a little something like this. So one, create environments. Create a dev and staging environment. Even though it may not be completely like prod, we should try to emulate it as much as possible. And by doing so, it makes collaboration much easier across the team. Two, code review. Branching and pull requests are key to iterate upon changes quickly, as well as catch bugs that say the programmer writing the code didn't notice. Three, testing. While we may not be able to introduce standard integration tests like software developers, we should still do our due diligence testing different things like um, pre-processing util, uh, util tools, as well as any feature just to ensure that it's working as expected. And then finally, model versioning and pipeline versioning. There is nothing worse than having to go into 2019 code base and try to figure out what we did with that model, its training artifacts, et cetera. And that's why it's so important to version our models and consolidate the artifacts with it so that we are able to replicate it and trace back all artifacts later. And then finally, the last principle, maintain simplicity, limit risk. Complexity breeds risk, but counterintuitive to the risk versus cost trade-off, it rarely ever brings high returns. And so I'm sure we're all familiar with the quote falsely attributed to Bill Gates. It goes something like this. I choose a lazy person to do a hard job because a lazy person will find an easy way to do it. Nonetheless, I think the relevancy of this quote as it pertains to DRE is still incredibly important. Because my hunch is, is that the reason data engineers are spending 56% of their time just trying to get their systems to work and only 22% on the innovation that leads real value is because they don't have the proper processes in place to make their systems simpler. These processes include everything that we just discussed, reducing toil, monitoring, automation, and CI/CD. And so I'm reminded of a time as just early on in my career as a software developer where we had to build out the most just complex back end and it had built up just so much code debt throughout the years that it was terrifying to even implement some of the most simple features. And so I have a video to share with you all that does a pretty good uh, summary of my experience. Just one feature. Why is this taking three years? But it's not that simple, all right? I have priorities, my team has deadlines. I'm still not understanding this. Why is it so hard to display the birthday date on the settings page? Why can't we get this done this quarter? Look, I'm sorry, we've been over this. It's the design of our back end. First, we have to build a bingo service. See, bingo knows everyone's name so we get the user's ID out of there. And from bingo, we can call Papaya and MBS to get that user ID and turn it into a user session token. We can validate those with OMNAP. And then, once we have that, we can finally pull the user's info down from Raccoon. Yeah, but couldn't the Raccoon team basically just... No, Raccoon isn't guaranteed to have that info. Before we do this, we have to go to Wingman, do a query to see if the user's willing to take it to the next level, or if they're just playing the field. 
Now, Winman is cool, but he doesn't store any user info himself. He has to reach out to other user info provider services like RGS, Barbie Doll, Ringo2, BLS. But how does it know what all the user provider services are? Well, for that, it has to go to Galactic, all knowing user service provider aggregator. Well, Galactus has omniscient knowledge of all current user info providers. It doesn't have future sight or knowledge of past user info providers, so it expects a time. You get the point. <laughs> so I totally implore everyone to get on YouTube and watch the rest of the video. It is an absolute hoot. But I think the funniest part of the video may not be the video itself, but one of the comments, this isn't a comedy. This is a documentary. <laughs> So I think all of us have experienced a chaotic system like this in our past, whether it be something that we built or inherited. And so this is why it is so important to maintain simplicity, because it means that we can deliver new features earlier and frequently. And in turn, it also means spending less time on executing the systems we're building and more time doing the things we love building the most amazingly innovative, fun, and delightfully imperfect solutions. Thank you.